Hello, everybody. My name is Graham Elwood, and you are watching The Political Vigilante Making Gotham Great Again. Um, I am joined uh, by Ron Placone. Ron, how are you doing today? What's up, Graham? I'm doing good, buddy. Host of the Howdy Howdy Morning Radio Hour. Wait, what's your show That's called? That's right. Get your news on with Ron. <laughs> it should be called Howdy Howdy and Friends. Yeah. All right. I'll switch it up. I'll switch it up. <laughs> Maybe I'm just trying to find new merch. Um, <laughs> so this article just came in, Ron. This this actually uh, this came out earlier in the year um, on how Finland has is ending homelessness. I'm going to put this graphic up right now. Finland ends homelessness and provides shelter for all in need. Now, this came out January 29th of 2020. And why this is relevant, and we're going to go through how they've done it, is because Utah is just starting, is doing this and having the same success rate. So I'm going to just read this a little bit, and then uh, Ron can weigh in. The country applies the housing first concept. Those affected by homelessness receive a small apartment and counseling without any preconditions. That's very critical. Because the way we try to do things in America, we're going to get into more of it, but like, oh, first you get clean and sober, then you get cleaned up, then maybe you find a job, then you get an apartment, right? So that's our sort of strategy here, which just doesn't seem to work. But here's how they figured it out in Finland. And they used to have a really bad homeless problem. Four to five people affected thus make their way back into a stable life. And all of this is cheaper than accepting homelessness. Wait, what? Huh? We're going to get into that, why it's cheaper. In 2008, you could see tent villages and huts standing between trees and the parks in Helsinki. Homeless people had built makeshift homes in the middle of Finland's capital city, which is exactly what is happening here in Los Angeles. There is more. There were so many tent cities before the quarantine pandemic, and now it's even worse as evictions keep going up. A bunch of them just happened last week when we hit the first of yep. the, the month. Yep. Um, since the 1980s, Finnish governments had been trying to reduce homelessness. Short-term shelters were built. However, long-term homeless people were still left out. There were too few emergency shelters, and many affected people did not manage to get out of homelessness. They couldn't find jobs, this is critical right here, without a housing address. This is why this housing first concept is so it's the reverse and it's revolutionary because this is how they would stay in the, in the cycle without any job. They couldn't find a flat. It was a vicious circle. They couldn't get a job because they didn't have an apartment and without a, a, an apartment, they couldn't get and with, with, without a job. They couldn't have an apartment. Like it was just this vicious circle. Furthermore, they had problems applying for social benefits. Again, you need an address to get social benefits. You need a place of residence to get social benefits. So here's what, Housing first, on the other hand, reverses the path. Homeless people get a flat without any preconditions. Social workers help them with applications for social benefits and are available for counseling in general. That is, I'm going to go into the, how that's worked, but Ron, I want to bring you in here. Um, what do you think of this? I mean, this is, I, I haven't, I've heard a little bit of this, but I'm just, was just researching this today and I think it's, I think it's amazing uh, especially as you know, you and I live in a city that has a massive homeless problem in a country that has probably, it had 500,000 homeless people before the pandemic. That number has got to be near a million now. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I do remember, um, this story from Finland, like, like I might've talked about it on get your news on with Ron or, or just, you know, kind of read it. Uh, so I do vaguely remember that. And I, I think that approach is just so obvious. Like you have to, it's kind of one of those things where it's, um, you know, like, uh, there's a, there's an author named, uh, Paulo Freire who wrote uh, a book called pedagogy of the oppressed, where he talks about how, you know, there's certain things that you just totally can't do. Uh, one of the big ones being learning if you're hungry. And he talked about how he grew up in poverty, so he just couldn't learn anything and he wasn't able to really go to school or anything like that. And then when he was able to learn, it was just such a big it was just such a big thing for him because he was actually so thirsty for knowledge, but he was also, you know, literally thirsty and hungry. Mm. But once he took care of that and he was able to take care of it because things got better, you know, it, it was just so eye opening for him. Um, you know, kind of on that notion, I, I think the big lesson is, you know, basic needs need to come first, which you're taught 
at a young age. That's food, clothing, and shelter. Um, so when you give people a house, when they have a place to go, okay, that need is met. So that's taken care of. So then they can kind of just sit down and be like, okay, what's next? Now they got to have food in their stomach, which I'd imagine that's part of this as well. Okay, so then they can take care of that. So what's next? Okay, well, now I'm kind of ready to go out in society. I mean, it's so obvious, whereas like going about it the other way, where it's, well, you got to you got to have a job so you can have an apartment. Uh, but, you know, you're out in the streets. You don't have an address. You don't have a residence. You you don't have, you know, you might not be able to get clean clothes. You might not be able to, um, you know, get food all the time. Uh, how are you going to be able to get a job? Yeah, I mean, this shows the whole, the, this, this, this just blows a hole in the whole and shows how the whole like bootstraps. Mm-hmm. is said, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And everybody says, yeah, well, we don't even, you know, I don't even have feet or whatever, you know, you know, I don't even have boots or whatever the, you know, the analogy is. And this is such a great example. Yes, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps when you have a home, when you yeah. have food, when you have all these basic needs met, then you can say, hey, you got to go out and be productive. But you're asking somebody to just go without all of these things. And when they, and when you see and people who say that have probably never been in the system of social services and finding all these, 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 uh, double edged swords and these catch 22s of like, well, you need an address. Well, I can't get an apartment. I don't have a job, you know? Like, and so you might not have an ID. You might not right. have, I, I mean, yeah. And here's the crazy part too, to, to just, just like, uh, insert this into this, but 44%, of homeless people in the US do have some kind of a job. Yeah. And that's not, I mean, that's just a statement to how desperate people are in our society and, and just how, you know, catastrophically corrupt the entire system is where working people still can't have a home. Um, so, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's just like, if we put housing first, just just imagine what people would be able to do. Yeah, imagine what it would and 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 the thing that's so amazing too is like so there's a 44% of the population of the homeless population that has jobs. And so if you gave them housing, then then they would gladly be more participating members of society. They would like I don't want to sleep in my car. I don't want to have to find a public restroom. Like, oh wow, you're treating me with dignity. And that's I think such the, the biggest hurdle for America as a society to come to grips with is we're a cruel, ugly, mean society. Like we, this is the fact that this is even, it's just so obvious to someone that isn't just, we're numb to this. We're numb to the tent cities. We're numb to the seven countries we're bombing. We're numb to, you know, police brutality. I mean, we're just numb to all of it. I mean, people are finally kind of waking up um, to, to, you know, obviously what happened with George Floyd getting murdered, but like people are starting to see the whole system's broken. And, I want to get into the cost of this stuff because uh, that's the other thing too. So, and also, also the other, so there's the 44%, as you said, in America that are working, but also in this housing first, anybody that's, you know, struggling with addiction, struggling with mental illness. Okay. They get a roof over the head. They get food, they get clothing, they get a shower, they get dignity. And then, Hey, now we can address your addiction problem. Now we can address whatever your whatever untreated mental illness you're dealing with or whatever, you know, even just the not even a just the like I'm depressed, not clinical depression. I'm just depressed because I'm hungry and I'm tired and I lost my job and I lost my home. Just that. Just like support for that. You're not a bad person. You're not a failure. Just like decency and compassion to help everybody. And as they said, four out of five people. That fifth person it's probably somebody with, you know, a severe drug problem that they just can't get clean on or severe mental illness that just they don't want to take their meds, which happens. But four out of five is an amazing recovery number. That is amazing success story in those numbers. Um, but I want to go into this um, about the cost because we all, oh, how are you going to, it's going to cost too much. You liberals just want to give everybody free everything. Give me, give me, give me. I mean, I, I hear your crazy ideas of treating people, sick people like they're actually sick instead of like criminals. Sounds really <laughs> radical, oh. but I don't think we can afford that. 
you godless socialists out there in California, I'm a Christian and Jesus would never help the poor. Oh, wait. He'd throw them in jail. Yeah, he would beat them. Which is... Which that doesn't cost any money at all. Our prison system is totally efficient. It's not corrupt or for profit or anything like that. And it actually rehabilitates people. And it's uh, it's totally inexpensive. So the way we're doing it now is perfect. It's a perfect We've nailed it. We have a perfect system. We Treating figured people, that one out. <laughs> Treating people less than human is great. But no, I want to get into the numbers here. Um, so for 10 years, the Housing First program provided 4,600 homes in Finland. In 2017, there were still about 1,900 people living on the streets, but there were enough places for them in emergency shelters so that they at least didn't have to sleep outside anymore. And here's the thing, going to that, we were just riffing on it, but the cost thing, oh, how are you going to pay for it? It's cheaper to do this housing first because when people are in emergency situations, which one happens when you're living on the streets, Emergencies are more frequent, assaults, injuries, breakdowns. The police, healthcare, and justice systems are more often called to step in, which costs more money. We can attest to that here in Los Angeles. The police department, LAPD, gets 54% of the operating budget, $3.1 billion. And I'm sure a large portion of that is dealing with the homeless problem. Dealing with the homeless issue. I've talked to cops where I live in Santa Monica, and they said we go on, I, we every day we respond to homeless. Every day. So that's man hours, that's all this money, resources, ambulances, crime report, whatever, destruction of property, any, any of that stuff. All that stuff costs a lot of money. So in comparison, Housing First is cheaper than accepting homelessness. Now the state spends 15,000 euros less per year per homeless person than before. And this model should be used ever. This model is also, it's cheaper to educate somebody and give them a job and free college and all this than it is to put them in prisons. But that's the problem. You have a for-profit prison system. But see, this model can be applied to fix so many of our problems. When we talk about defunding the police, we're talking about refunding programs like this. Rather than give right. cops riot gear and all of that, we would fund this yeah. kind of program, which is cheaper. Imagine instead of cops having a tank that they just ride around drunk on a Saturday night when they want to make a dumb decision. Imagine instead there's a facility in your neighborhood to help the homeless and give them housing and rehabilitate them if, if needed and give them treatment if, if they have an addiction issue. You know, Job training, that. whatever. Yeah. I mean, like, imagine that. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and. You know, about some of the people who, like I'm seeing now since the pandemic near me, people who like are sleeping in a tent and then they have like shelves and, and stuff that you can tell they just moved out of an apartment or something. They I've been seeing that too. Yeah. And I've been like, seeing a lot of that. Oh, imagine if they got housing and it's like, and then it's like, we get, we get them off, we get them fed, clothed, taken care of, and then go, what's your job training? Oh, I used to work here. I have this skill. I have that. Okay, let's job placement, job yeah. training, all of this stuff. Like, put them to work. Like, and, and you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a surfer and I'm outside a lot. And I'm at the beach. And there's, you know, there's like trash by the beach, whatever. Couldn't we, all these people... We give them homes, we give them jobs, and just put people to work cleaning up everything, just making everything look like there's so much work that could be done in that, in infrastructure, in all of that stuff. So we can do it here, and in fact, we have. This just came out, July 7th, Housing First, Utah ends homelessness and provides shelter for all. Utah is doing the same thing program housing first utah the progressive utopia that yeah, the progressive the, the, the socialist hell zone of utah <laughs> so that tells you something right utah is the reddest of red states um and they figured it out because that's the key here it's almost like it well it's very similar in in the um what is it? The Inconvenient Truth sequel, A More Inconvenient Truth, I think it was called, where Al Gore goes to this very, this small red town in this small town in Texas, in the reddest of counties, in the reddest of states, and the mayor, who openly Republican, whatever, said, oh, we went to more green energy because it was cheaper. Like, yeah. 
the solutions we're asking for in this socialist nightmare of treating people with dignity um, is cheaper. It, it, it costs less money. It saves everybody money. And then also, I would add this. You clean up the 10 cities in whatever town you're in. You give people dignity and homes and jobs and everything. It's better for property values, businesses, like schools, schools, everything, everybody, everything. Feels. Yeah. Everything goes up in a community. I, I mean, it's, um, you know, what's that? Cli- well, it's not a cliche. It's, it's, it's a, it's a quote, but, but the quote, like society is judged on, on how you take care of the most vulnerable mm-hmm. among us, or, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, but it's, um, you know, that that's very true. And, and if you want to have a community, if you want to have a city, you know, if you're not going to try to look out for everybody, if you're not going to try to, you know, make sure everybody has a roof over their head and food in their belly and a quality of life, well, then what's the point of having a city? Yeah. What, what are you doing it for then? Yeah. What, what, I mean, you, you think we, we couldn't eventually figure out trash collection if we had to? <laughs> what's the point of having a city? You know, I mean, it's it's one of those things, and I, and I know that's really just stripping it down to its most basic, but when you look around us, you know, in this pandemic, and, and you look at how we're handling it, which is absolutely insulting and disgusting compared to so much of the world, it's just, when you get down to the most basic, okay, there's a number of things that you have a federal government for, no matter, and I know, uh, like, the particulars, we, we can debate those, and then there's different, you know, ideologies going on here, but... At the end of the day, there's a few things as to why we have a federal government. One of them is when something like a pandemic happens, which it typically happens once every freaking hundred years, mm-hmm. they got you. That's one of the things. Yeah. That sort of if you're gonna do a country, that's on the that's on the checklist. You gotta check that freaking box. If there's a pandemic, we're handling it. We failed at that. So it's like what do you have in a country for then? What's it freaking for if it's going to tell its people to go pound sand during a pandemic? What's a city for if it doesn't care about everyone that lives there? I, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. Like, what's this really for then? Yeah, exactly. All of the things that cities already have were designed to make everybody's life better. Trash collection, libraries, schools, fire departments, you know, in theory, police departments, parks, all this stuff. I mean, all of this stuff was designed to, oh, we're, the city takes, we're all, it's the community. We're all in this together. We're all working together. Our tax dollars go to help everybody. Like, what's the point of this? I mean, do you really just want to live in a city where you just live in some mansion and, and then there's people living in tent cities and fuck them? Is that I mean? Like, I'm just like, what? Well, I don't get it. Like, don't you, and it's, if you're just selfish, if you're just a selfish person that just only cares about your money and your home and your neighborhood and your business, you should still want this housing first. You should still want these fix- issues fixed because. Yeah. Well, the- when, you know, when people are desperate, guess what happens? Stuff like crime goes up. Yeah. You know, property value, as you mentioned, goes down. No, no matter how rich you are, don't you want to be able to, you know, walk around your city and go get something to eat and, and or go to the theater or whatever else it is and feel safe. Don't you want that? Don't you want to live in that place? Yeah. Do you really want to just be limited to walking around your gated community with a tennis court and that's it? And never go outside. I mean, like some, several older, like white wealthy people in Santa Monica were, Oh, they were so outraged about the labor, the looting. And look, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't happy that the looting happened. It happened blocks from my home. I saw it up close. I was at the protest, but I'm like, so I'm assuming you didn't like the looting. Wouldn't you want to put programs in place to, to, they couldn't, oh, the looting is just these kids causing, no, no, there's an economic reason. You know, one person was trying to tell, well, Dr. King would never, no, 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 no. Dr. King said (laughs) rioting and looting didn't happen, doesn't happen out of thin air. So mm-hmm. when people have all their needs met and, and if all of L.A. had nice schools and parks and libraries and jobs and no poverty and no homelessness, no one would need to loot. There'd be no we wouldn't be no, there would be no need for a protest because our police departments wouldn't be murdering on our black people. Like it, everyone would feel like, oh, good. The police. Oh, we have we've dealt with the homeless problem. Our schools are great. Like the, none of this would be none of none of this would happen. I mean, 
looting and rioting comes from the collapse of all of these things and the manifestation of all of society's ills not being addressed. You keep pushing the shit under the rug and not dealing with it and just buying cops more armory and military grade weapons rather than spending money on schools and homeless and everything else. This is what you get, man. This is what you get. So um, if you talk and goddamn do this, everyone can like, and, and hopefully this is one of those things where, you know, um, yeah, I've talked about this before, and you've heard me talk about this before. A big thing to me is uh, municipal broadband and city-owned yep. internet, and I want to try to get that all throughout the country. And, and that's another thing. The one thing that has in common with something like this is that it's really, you know, it's taken power, you know, no pun intended, in the communities. This is like a one community at a time type thing. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I've noticed about this from day one is that this is one of those things that when other people see it and other communities see it, they want it Yes, because it pretty much has a hundred. I mean, there was a Harvard study uh, pretty much a hundred percent of the time, a city owned internet project, a municipal broadband project is better than what the big cable uh, duopolies offer. Um, you know, go figure. But uh, so, you know, like the most municipal broadband projects in the country right now is uh, in another progressive utopia, Graham, Tennessee, the state of Tennessee. <laughs> Uh, why is that? Well, that's because Chattanooga has one of the, you know, like they got municipal broadband almost before anyone else because uh, of like this power grid. So they've had this extensive system for a long time. Now they have some of the best internet, not just in the country, but in the world. They mm -hmm. pay a reasonable price for it, less than what most people pay for their cable. Um, and other places in Tennessee were like, whoa, that's cool. We want that. Um, you know, and I'm sure Beverly it attracts, Hills is work. I'm, I'm, I'm just interjecting. I'm sure it's attracted businesses and digital nomads, you know, people that have online businesses that can work from anywhere that just need good internet. Yeah, well, it totally has. I mean, Chattanooga brands itself is, is gig city and, um, it's actually, it's actually really, I don't know if you've ever been, but Chattanooga, it, it's one of the most underrated places in the country, in my opinion, it's actually a really, really cool area. But, uh, but anyway, so what, a what connecting it to this, like when people see a housing first approach work, what you're really hoping is that spreads. And, and I'm really glad Utah is doing this, I guess, just for the sake of uh, just for the sake of logistics. I, I kind of wish that like somewhere on the East Coast would have done it first, just because you know, it, it's, it's a more, um, it's a more dense area. So more like, like if New Jersey tried it, then, oh man, Rhode Island's looking at them and Connecticut's looking right, and right. New York's looking. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you get, so with Utah, it's kind of, it's a lot more spread out. So it's like, okay, well, is Nevada looking is, but nonetheless, if one state nails it, it's going to spread and that's going to be a beautiful thing. Yeah. If Utah can do this, I mean, California, let's go. I mean, for real, like Utah is going to beat us to something progressive. Okay. I mean, San Francisco and Los Angeles have probably two of the worst homeless issues of any, any two cities in the country. I mean, it is yeah. un. Uh, San Francisco is un. it's unrecognizable anymore. That city it's un. I mean, probably because of the Silicon Valley, but that's part of the reason Silicon Valley people have come in. All the rents are through the roof. No one can afford to live there and everyone's living on the street. I mean, it's like, I interviewed a guy in this show who lives in uh, uh, a gray who, who has a full-time job and was living in his car. You know, he yeah, was one of those in the 44% and it's like, we need, and if it's cheaper, then I don't want to hear it. If it's cheaper than enough, there's no talk. There's no, there's no, how are we going to pay for it? Oh, it's too much of it. No, 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 no. It's less expensive. It's less expensive to give social programs than it is to arm police departments. It's less expensive to help the homeless and have decency and compassion than it is to fucking spend, outspend the next 10 countries combined on bombing people. It would cost less money to go build schools and hospitals and roads in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, all the countries were bombing. I guarantee you it would cost less money to do that because that's what China's mm -hmm. doing all throughout um, – Africa and the Middle East. China isn't bombing anybody. This is how China is exerting its influence. It's it's paying for ship for ports so they can ship their products. It's updating. It's they're being paying for stadiums and movie theaters and all this crap. That's what that's what China. That's how China does it. They don't roll their tanks in. They don't depose a leader. They just say we'll pay for it. <laughs> we'll pay for it. And it's like we could be doing that. 
And but I think it also brings in. We'll, we'll wrap up this 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 segment here. It goes back to what you were saying, and it's a thing I talk about. On, we talk about on both of our shows. Is this is how important getting shit done on the local level is? We all, yeah, yeah it would have been great if Bernie, but but I think too many people thought Bernie was going to just be some sort of messiah that was going to come in and wave his wand and everything was going to be fixed. Had Bernie got the nomination and eventually the presidency, it just would have been a catalyst for stuff like this. But the point being, look. Look what Seattle, their city council last month voted, they cannot use tear gas and rubber bullets and stuff like that. I mean, it has to happen on a local level. And this housing first approach, everybody who's watching this show needs to start pushing this with your local city council and your mayor's office and your state yep. representatives and your governor right now. Absolutely. Yeah, because that's where you have the power. And we're seeing that especially with the protests. You know, when you get out and you protest, that's where you have the power, where they have to listen. Yeah, absolutely. Rob Lacone, go to roblacone.com to check out all of the Ron Placone-ness that's out in the world. That's that's what it says on the website. It's like, <laughs> welcome to all the Ron Placone-ness in the world. It's all right here. <laughs> Shave your knuckles for justice. Share and subscribe. Hit the bell notification button and the subscribe button, even if you've done it before because they're unsubscribing many of you every day. Watch the ads all the way through. If you click skip ad, I don't get paid. Also, support us at patreon.com slash Graham Elwood or rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood. Rockfin.com is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. All my videos are on Rockfin ad free. Thanks for watching.